So today's reshuffle suddenly got a lot more dramatic after Sajid Javid unexpectedly quit as Chancellor after Boris Johnson ordered him to fire his closest aides. Mr Javid said that that was a condition which no self-respecting minister would accept. And off he went. He'll be replaced by Rishi Sunak just four weeks before the budget is due to happen, whilst Downing Street says a new joint team of special advisers is being established to advise, to advise both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in Downing Street now. Gary. Make no mistake, this is a power grab by number 10, and they want to write the next budget and the one after that, and the one after that. Sources are saying in number 10 tonight that this is uh, nothing to see here. All they want to do is resurrect the sort of relationship that David Cameron and George Osborne had when they were uh, neighbours here. This is very different because they had uh, grown up together uh, in opposition. Their teams had, had, had moved uh, backwards and forwards and, and, and trusted each other. This is of a very different order. And it matters because for, for decades, uh, the Treasury uh, has been the institution in Whitehall that says no when you have a prime minister in there uh, whose instinct is to spend more to get re-elected. And so the guess has got to be that the only reason they're doing this is because they want to spend more than number 11 and the Treasury uh, would normally like. And that is what is going through minds in the Treasury tonight, where there is real anxiety. Some old hands are telling them, don't worry, the Treasury will uh, re-emerge from this. Uh, no. Prime Minister could afford to lose two chancellors in these sorts of circumstances, so the new chancellor is super powerful and unsackable. But how much does the new chancellor really want to assert himself, and how much do they really want to spend in there? Those are giant questions that are lying around in front of us uh, tonight. At the end of the general election, a new government with a big majority, we thought some new certainties were around. Uh, tonight, uh, the knowns have been knocked down and a whole new tray of unknowns have been thrown in front of us. The ministers who walk up Downing Street on reshuffle day are meant to be the ones who are keeping their jobs. But Sajid Javid couldn't accept the changed job terms on offer. The Prime Minister spent an hour trying to persuade his Chancellor to stay put, but Sajid Javid said no and four weeks short of his planned budget resigned and went home instead. Javid, Good, afternoon. Possible, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Why do you resign, Mr. Javid? Mr. Dominic Cummings forced you out. Were you pushed out? Was it a power Lovely draft? to see you. Thank you. All a world away from Tuesday, when it was all smiles for the HS2 launch in Birmingham. But there's been tension for months between the teams that work for these two. Today, the Prime Minister told Sajid Javid he must sack his close aides or special advisers and work with aides appointed by number 10 instead. The plan is the brainchild of the Prime Minister's own chief aide, Dominic Cummings, who'd already infuriated Sajid Javid by sacking an advisor of his last August and having her marched out of number 10 under police escort. It's been a huge honour to serve as Chancellor of the Exchequer. And whilst I was very pleased that the Prime Minister wanted to reappoint me, I was unable to accept the conditions that he had attached. So I felt I was left with no option other than to resign. Did you regard yourself as Chancellor in name only? And if so, was that because of the influence of Dominic Cummings, the Prime Minister's Chief Advisor? The conditions that were attached uh, was a requirement that I replace all my political advisers. You know, these are people that have worked incredibly hard on behalf of not just the government but the whole country, done a fantastic job. I was unable to accept those conditions. I don't believe any self-respecting minister would accept such conditions. And so therefore I felt the best thing to do was to go. Were those conditions imposed by Mr Cummings? Those were the conditions uh, requested by the Prime Minister. Arriving at the Treasury, the new Chancellor who did accept those conditions, Rishi Sunak. He was Sajid Javid's deputy in charge of spending. He's the darling of Boris Johnson's closest circle, a public school educated former banker and hedge fund manager. Delighted to be appointed, lots to get on with. Thanks very much. Are you going to be the Prime Minister's puppet? Has the department he now heads had its authority slashed? Will it fight back? How many others in this building are smiling tonight? This morning, it looked like reshuffle casualties would be further down the table, like the Northern Ireland Secretary, Julian Smith, who managed to restore power sharing in Northern Ireland last month, only to get the boot today. In Dublin, Ireland's Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, signalled he was unimpressed with that move, calling Julian Smith one of Britain's finest politicians of our time.
it's up to the Prime Minister and that is the uh, responsibility he has to choose the cabinet that he wants and it's great serving in it but if you know it's his always the Prime Minister of the day's call. His thought crime, Julian Smith, is believed to have wavered last autumn when Number 10 wanted all ministers ready to back a no-deal Brexit. Andrea Leadsom, who fought Theresa May for the leadership in 2016, was one of four women to lose their place around the Cabinet table. Number 10 suggests it might try to correct that tally in a future reshuffle. In his resignation letter, Sajid Javid appeared to warn the Prime Minister off his chief adviser, saying it's important as leaders to have trusted teams that reflect the character and integrity that you would wish to be associated with. And he warned the Prime Minister, I would urge you to ensure the Treasury as an institution retains as much credibility as possible. It's great for number 10 in the short term to get its way and there's a, you know, there's a sugar high from that. But actually, over time, uh, th that kind of balance and those kind of uh, uh, you know, constructive questioning and, uh, and, and, and challenge is, is a good thing for good government. I'm going to uh, give you an absolutely categorical assurance that I will keep Sajid Javid as my chancellor. How about that? An election pledge only 87 days ago. Will other promises on spending restraint maybe go the same way? Will the Treasury and number 11 lose its authority and identity to the mighty neighbour next door? I'm now joined here by Craig Oliver, uh, who served as David Cameron's communications chief in number 10, and Anita Boating, who was a special advisor to David Liddington and Brandon Lewis. Welcome to you both. Um, We'll listen to what David Gork will have to say in a minute, hopefully, if we can get the line back up. Craig Oliver, let me start with you. Sajid Javid resigning out of principle. Was he falling into a trap there? Well, I think he certainly was set up in the sense that I think they knew that it was highly unlikely that anybody would accept the conditions that they were offering and that he was likely to walk. So when it first came out, everybody was in total shock and thinking, oh, oh my goodness, this has probably thrown a huge problem into the reshuffle. But actually, very, very quickly, Rishi Sunak was put straight in. And that looked to me like there'd been a plan. But it is astonishing, isn't it? I mean, Sajid Javid has had an extraordinary career, came from, you know, humble uh, immigrant backgrounds, you know, uh, became Chancellor of the Exchequer. For him to have that conversation with Boris Johnson this morning, to be given these impossible demands and then decide to resign, perhaps ending his political career forever, is a dramatic moment, isn't it? It's an extraordinary moment and a dramatic moment, but I think you've got to see it in the context of an administration that is showing very, very clearly today that they mean business. They are an administration that wants to take power very centrally into number 10. We're in an age now where modern communications mean that the next story is the time it takes somebody to do a tweet. Government departments can be doing God knows what at God knows what time. And what they're thinking is, I think, is if they have fingertip control, then they can only be the people who are responsible. I'm not sure, sorry, briefly, if you, are you telling me it's a good idea or a bad idea that he's gone? I think that most recent governments have thought that they increasingly need to centralise and that that is what they've been trying to do. And what they said to Sajid Javid is either you accept that centralisation and our people or you can walk, and he walked. Anita. And people always forget how much healthy resources number 10 can have sometimes. So the Treasury will have thousands of officials focusing purely on economic policy and that is going to be a key consideration for this government as it seeks to win the 2024 election. A lot of the levers around levelling up come from Treasury and there's always been this disconnect between Treasury and number 10 in terms of that power base and that policy base and bringing those two things together mm. will make number 10 more effective. And there's always different ways of resolving this tension. There's the kind of David Cameron, George Osborne model, which, you know, Craig will remember well, mm. where the two worked very much in lockstep. Was that the That's, exception? Well, that may be the exception, because okay. this relationship, I think, will be slightly more number 10, a bit more in charge, and, and the Treasury kind of brought in much more in line with what number 10 would like to see. But, I think it's quite sensible. Because for David day, Cameron and George Osborne, there was also Nigel Lawson and Margaret Thatcher, when they fell out with each Absolutely. other, arguably that was the Gordon end of Brown her, and Gordon Brown and Tony Blair, famously. These, this is a very difficult relationship. And if this government, as Craig says, means business and really wants to deliver, particularly levelling up the North and the Midlands, it really needs much more control over the engines of growth. But what about, you know, Abraham Lincoln's famous team of rivals? That's the way he described his cabinet. Uh, you know, he was they, the boss, they but they basically they Twitter were... Then. They didn't have <laughs> Twitter then. No, but seriously, what about people who, you know, believe in what they do, they've got their brief, they've got the, you know, the cleverest people that they trust around them, 
Shouldn't that be what cabinet is all about? It, this is a campaigning government. This, and when you're in a campaign, what you need is people that can deliver. And this is a very self-confident reshuffle, I would say. It's people who have been shown they can deliver, people who have shown they're loyal, people who have shown they're active in their departments that have gotten the promotions. And that's what ultimately what Number 10 wants in this election, I mean, in, in, in this reshuffle. Does Dominic Cummings and does Boris Johnson want a revolution here? Look, they, they are driven and they want to be a government that makes a mark. I remember David Cameron saying to me that there is a fault line at the very heart of government and any pol student of politics notices that the fault line is between number 10 and number 11. His way of dealing with it was to have a blood brother that he completely trusted and worked in lockstep with mm. and made sure that all their special advisers knew to work together. Boris doesn't have that. His way of dealing with it is to say, I'm effectively taking over. Sajid Javid said very pointedly, no minister, you know, who has a degree of self-respect would deal with these kind of conditions. Is he basically saying that everyone else who's stayed in the cabinet is spineless? Well, they haven't been quite clear yet what's happening with all the special advisers. One of the rumours I heard today is that Dominic is trying to actually have a central bank of, of special advisers that are then farmed out to ministers. What currently tends to happen is that the minister gets to hire who the person he was. He sees that as a problem. He sees that as setting the government up for failure and people briefing against it and causing problems. So there is a lot of sense in trying to take control. A lot of people will also say that there's an element of control freakery too. And there's who? always been this tension between mm. the two things, which is as a special advisor, you want to be loyal to your Secretary of State, but you also know that you serve the, at the pleasure of the Prime Minister. And there's always been this balancing act between showing that loyalty and improving your department whilst also being loyal to Number 10. And they've sought a different way of tackling that particular problem. So you must be talking to some of your colleagues and friends who are still working at, you know, Number 10 or around Number 10. How afraid are they of Dominic Cummings? I don't think it's a question of fear. It's, it's a different relationship. It's very, very clear who's in charge, and they very much have to... That no, sounds like fear to, to me. Tune. What do you think, Craig? Yeah, no, I think it's pure Machiavelli. It's better to be feared than to be loved, and I think he knows what he's doing by making sure that they know that they serve at his pleasure. Is he more powerful than the Prime Minister? No, no. because che being a PM, it's like a game of chess. The king is the last piece to fall, and he is the king in this. So everybody goes under the bus before the king. So no, he is not, and Boris still has the power, but he is a very powerful figure. But did Boris Johnson want to get rid of Sajid Javid, do you think? Absolutely. I think this is clearly an indication that Dominic Cummings is trusted by the Prime Minister, but he does still slur over the pleasure of the Prime Minister, and that's what we're seeing today. A number 10 and a confident Boris Johnson solidifying what he wants to do for the next five years. And I think that it was been, there's been numerous briefings that Dominic didn't think very much of Sajid, mm. um, and that's come to pass today. Just briefly, Suella Braveman, um, Attorney General, relatively inexperienced. She wasn't a QC, a, a barrister. I mean, is this an attack on the judiciary? I, th I think that that is a... That's, that's a what bit, some people are saying. Well, no, but lawyers always say that. Whoever gets made um, Minister of Justice... Or Don't whatever, we want strong, think, confident I mean, lawyers, Craig? No, well, everybody always says that about yeah, the situation. I, mean, I, 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 I find that a bit of a stretch. So, I mean, basically, you're OK. Both of you are OK with I, all of this. I, I no, yeah. no, no, no. Hang on. So, David Liddington, I mean, I worked for him and we went into the Ministry of Justice and he wasn't a former lawyer. I think some of these decisions are... in political, and that's why these roles are politically, mm. politically appointed. And so what you're seeing is a government, again, wanting someone who feels like more of a team player, who's going to communicate, being part of the cabinet table, and it, that's if, sensible. If I was a cabinet minister, it would bother me. But I can totally see why somebody in number 10, in the light of the way the media operates in the digital world and all the things that are going on, who wants to make big changes and doesn't want to feel that they're constantly fighting within, would do this. Yeah. If you were still in the you know, in the government, how would you deal with God, Dominic Cummings in 10 seconds? How would I deal yes. with him? Well, I suspect he'd be my boss if I was still <laughs> exactly. in the government. You'd say yes. OK. <laughs> Craig Oliver, Anita Boating, thanks very much. John. Well, I'm now able to talk to the former Conservative Cabinet Minister, David Gork, who served in the Treasury for seven years. Um, David Gork, uh, can you just tell us, is there any drawback to what these special advisers or former special advisers seem to be thrilling over? The idea that you're going to combine special advisers in these two departments and therefore there'll be total agreement all the time. Well, in theory, if you can have uh, Number 10 and the Treasury working very closely together, that's obviously a good thing. And I was in the Treasury at the time when David Cameron and George Osborne worked very closely and their advisers worked very closely together. And that was to the benefit of the government. But I think the difference here, and, and, and Craig touched on this, 
is that the, this is essentially number 10 taking over the Treasury. And the difficulty there is that you need a strong organisation uh, in government that is able to ask the bothersome questions about can we afford this? Is this good value for money? Is this sustainable over the long term to protect the interests of the taxpayer, to protect the interests of consumers, if you like, and not just to be sort of focused, as number 10 often is? Well, now, I don't, um, I don't think that that is f- fair because um, you can work constructively and indeed the Treasury can be constructive and positive, but you do also have to deal with the fact that you know, there are limits to uh, the money that you've got available, that you do have to ensure that there is uh, value for money tests, and that's the role of the Treasury, and it is right that the Treasury is a strong part of government. Yeah, but what you can hear, and after all, this is a very unusual Prime Minister, and he's got a very unusual special advisor, and you can kind of hear them saying, I don't care if we can't afford it, we're going to do it. And there's no Treasury to say, hang on a minute, absolutely no, we can't afford it. Well, that's exactly the point. That, that is the risk here, the danger here, is that at all times, you know, most Prime Ministers have moments of impatience where they just want to get get something done, to coin a phrase. (laughs) And sometimes you need voices of caution to be able to say, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that, or if we want to do this, this is the best way in which we do it. And that is where the Treasury comes in. And it doesn't have to be a purely negative thing, but it can be about what is the best way of achieving a particular objective. And you you do have to bear in mind that there are limited resources. You have to deploy those resources sensibly. And a strong treasury can enable the government to deliver successful and effective policies, but it can also prevent uh, foolish, unwise policies. uh, 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 Let me raise another point with you, because the budget is but four weeks away. You've got an entirely new lot of uh, special advisors. You've got a brand new chance with the Exchequer. What sort of a mess is the budget going to be? Well, very interesting question. And you've <laughs> got to remember that although it's four weeks away, you know, there are certain things that have to be got into the Office of Budget Responsibility. You know, they essentially need to have all the measures a week or so in advance of that. So it's, it's not actually four weeks in truth. All the decisions are going to have to be made within two or three weeks. Um, but from your experience, wouldn't you say... The budget well, is already well de- delivered. Exactly. I mean, it has already well been developed. written, presumably, effectively. A, a l- large elements of it will be. Not all the decisions will have been made, but the choices that could be made will have been narrowed, so the options will become clearer, and one would hope that most of the work into in the, to the next budget will have been completed. But yes, it's, uh, it's, they're going to be burning the midnight oil for the, for the next few weeks. One very brief question then. What about this Dominic Cummings? Is it healthy? Nah. <laughs> I don't think it is. Um, you, you'll not be surprised for me to, to hear that, given, <laughs> given my personal history. But I do think that there is a, a lot of power being concentrated in the hands of the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's chief advisor. And just on the pure complexity of government, there are so many decisions that have to be made. So much has to be taken into account. It is very hard for one or two people to do that. That's why you need strong departments, not just the Treasury, but other departments as well that really understand the issues, that can bring that knowledge and expertise to making judgments, because if it comes down to the, the, the whims, if you like, of just one or two people, you end up making very foolish errors. David Gork, thank you very much indeed for joining us.